Welcome to Peace, Love, and Soup, bringing you a significant soup each month, along with culture, cooking, and conversation. Well, top of the morning to ya, and a fine day it is, me friend. That's the greeting you'll hear every time of the year on the island of Ireland. Top of the morning to ya. Have a happy, magical day. This month on Peace, Love, and Soup, we're going Irish. Tell them about it, Brian. It's going to be a magically delicious episode. Not only are we making Dublin Coddle, but... We're also making Irish soda bread with our guest baker, Dan Fagan. We'll talk to my dad, Jackie Boy Delaney. We'll also go to a St. Patrick's Day party and interview unsuspecting people about jokes and soup stories that they may have. Can't wait. Music, culture. Sounds like a magical time, Brian. (laughs) Bring your spoons. Cheers. Cheers. To your ears. In celebration of St. Patrick's Day, let's yes. call my dad. Yeah, let's give him a call. Jack Delaney, an mm-hmm. East Coast Boston Irishman. Yes. yes. So it's a dying breed. It is, they are. <laughs> let's call the Jack. The Delaney's of Boston. Hi, Brian. Hello, Dad. Hi, Jack. This is Tave. Hi, Tommy. How are you? Oh, t- <laughs> <laughs> Tave. Oh, Tave. With oh, a I'm V. Sorry. With a V like Victor. Well, you, you, us people from Boston, don't understand the rest of your world. It's okay. Just call me Tave. <laughs> All right, Tave. <laughs> no, I like Tavi better. So, Dad, the theme of today's program is St. Patrick's Day, and we were calling you to get your recollection of growing up in Boston, Irish. Or a St. Patrick's Day story, Jack. So that'd be great, too. Okay. Um, I'm Jack Delaney, and I grew up in Boston. You can probably tell by my speech. We speak the King's English out here. (laughs) Boston was a great spot to grow up, and being Irish made it even better. And uh, my family was Irish. We lived in an Irish part of the city. It was called Dorchester. And there was a parade. Every March 17th, we went to the St. Patrick's Day Parade. And when I got old enough, we did the bar hop around South Boston and Dorchester, I think Brian and his three brothers probably went to one or two of those March 17ths. Of course, I wouldn't allow them to go to the bars. But you don't think they snuck in when they were underage into well, the bars? Well, I, I, I would <laughs> hardly believe that they would do that. Oh, my goodness. But it was a, it was a wonderful time. And, and Boston and New York and Chicago have big, huge, uh, as Donald would say, <laughs> huge Irish populations in them. When the Irish came here, when the famine hit Ireland, uh, a lot of them settled in uh, Boston and then on to New York and up into the Canadian provinces of uh, Nova Scotia. Your parents didn't come over from Ireland, but it was their parents that did? Yeah, my grandmother came here to work as a, um, a domestic in one of the homes out in Brookline, Massachusetts, which was kind of an upscale area, wasp mm-hmm. area. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Still so, is. And my grandfather started a roofing business. Now, was your grandmother a good cook? Did she make... Oh, she was a wonderful cook. Every Sunday, we went to my grandmother's house for a wonderful dinner, and it was a whole afternoon of eating. So Delaney family dinners? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what would you eat on St. Patrick's Day? Would you eat we'd, coddle? We'd have, yeah, we'd have corned beef and cabbage. We'd have soda bread. We'd have uh, puddings. We'd have pudding. Do you recall her making any soups or stews? They Tell made, us about yeah. that. In the Irish household, there wasn't a lot, a lot of money. So normally there would be a roast. There'd be the roast beef or a roast lamb or there'd be fish mm-hmm. is the main stay of the meal. And what was left over would become stews or would mm-hmm. become soups. And those soups and those stews would last for two or three days. So you might have roast beef on a Sunday for the main meal, but you'll have various uh, derivatives of the roast beef that were left over from Sunday. And it was good. And then you never complained about that. Who would be complaining? I'm crazy about soup. <laughs> yeah. So it was a great gathering you know you went to mass on a sunday and then you went to grandma's you know 
Not so much this generation anymore, though, huh? No, no, that that was kind of pleasant. And as you look back, you know, it was fun. It was a fun day, and you look forward to. It. And then they'd play the Irish Hour. I mean, there'd be a whole two and a half hours of Irish music on every day, Sunday. On the radio. On the radio, yeah. I don't know what the station is. It's still on out of Boston, and they play on late Saturday afternoon. And for the younger people, even your mother, who grew up in an Italian home, Irish dancing was a big thing. Real, even for the Italians? Yeah, yeah. You know, the tap dancing and all of the things mm-hmm. that the Irish do. When we were off at college, uh, Tommy and Jay and Teddy and myself, Every Sunday night, we'd go down to Hibernian Hall, which is um, the Irish Maids' Night, and all of the maids would be around, and you'd do dancing to Irish music. Maids as in domestic servants or maids as in lassies? (laughs) That's what most of them were. Well, if they were maids, what were you all doing? Were you like... School. We were all at college. It was fun. Well, you and mom were amazing dancers when your bodies were able to, yeah. you know, <laughs> move around the dance floor. <laughs> but, uh, really? What kind of dances did you do, Jack? Well, we did the Irish dancing and the reels that they call them. Oh, yeah. But then when we matured, um, <laughs> jitterbug. I mean, <gasps> God, I was in the what? era of jitterbugging. And my dad was quite a dancer, and it was just in the the jeans and really oh god yeah like yeah, the lindy yeah. hop and the whole thing all of them, <gasps> all of them. yeah beautiful to and, watch and despite what brian thinks i still can out <laughs> <laughs> i bet you can oh I've, no he's a hell of a dancer. i need to see some video of this i'm more of a modern dancer <laughs> is that oh, true no, brian no. delaney he's pretty good i've known for dropping good. people in plants uh, <laughs> yeah. dancing was a big thing as we were growing up in you know in our late teens and early 20s and uh, we had a number of places. Blinstrom's was a big dance club. The Totem Pole up at Nombiga Park, and where they brought in all the big bands, okay? Mm-hmm. And you would go there, and that's, that was a big thing. That was a big deal. If you were invited a gal, that was a big night out, okay? You were serious about her if you took yeah, her out for that, that. that was a serious date. And, I mean, we saw some of the greatest bands. I mean... Who were some of them? Do you recall the names of any of the uh, bands? Frank Sinatra was the biggest we saw. You saw Frank Sinatra? Yeah, and I saw Sammy Kay. Yeah, that wouldn't mean anything to you. Uh, the Dorsey Brothers, mm-hmm. Tom and Jimmy Dorsey. Uh, oh, God. Rosemary Clooney. Nice. That, oh, that, was, that was a big, big time. Yeah, yeah. So on my dad's side, Dion and the Belmonts, Dion DiMucci, he's yeah, in well my that, family. That, you're kidding. No, he's in our family. He's on my dad's side. We're Italian oh, on my dad's side. Oh, he was big time. Yeah, he was a goodie. He is a goodie still. Is he still performing? Yeah, he still is. Wow. Yeah. What a coincidence. But he was an Italian, so did you Irish folk like listening to the Italians sing? <laughs> if they were good musicians, mm-hmm. it didn't matter. <laughs> Color and ethnicity did not make any, I mean, those were a good time. So you went to Ireland, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I went to Ireland on a trip, breathtaking, okay? And we oh, we visited four or five villages, and the, and the country itself is still... It's still fairly untouched. Yeah, and, you know, as you're doing it, and as you're going around, I mean, the roads, they're terrible, the roads. And you have to stop if there's a cow or a, a, a donkey going across the road. They, they have precedence, okay? Right. And the people of Ireland are so relaxed and mm-hmm. so laid back, it's refreshing. I have a joke for you. You ready? Go. All right. It's called The Irish Priest. An Irish priest is driving from Boston to New York and gets stopped for speeding in Connecticut. The state trooper smells alcohol on the priest's breath and then sees an empty wine bottle on the floor of the car. <laughs> he says, sir, have you been drinking? The priest says, just water. The trooper then says, then why do I smell wine? The priest looks at the bottle and says, good Lord, he's done it again. (laughs) (laughs) I thought you'd like that. Miracle. It's a miracle. (laughs) Do you have any jokes? I I don't, but I did have a song that I sang to a hundred year old nun (laughs) who they had a birthday party for. And, um, so I'll, I'll give you that. I'm going to okay. need to hear that. Yes. yes. My backup plan was to go into the nunnery. And then I found out that 
they don't want you. The nuns don't want you if you're really? over 40. What the old priests would say, I don't know about these young gals. They want to give their bodies to men and their bones to God or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I can see an old priest telling you that. Something like that. It's like, what? And yeah, it ruined my whole idea for a backup plan. God forbid something happened to my husband. They won't take you. They won't. They won't take me. I'm too old to be a nun now. <laughs> Are you all ready? Yeah, we're ready we're now. Set. Thanks, okay. Dad. All right. Oh, there were fighters and writers and Irish dynamiters. There was beer, gin, whiskey, wine, and cake. There were men in fine positions. There were Irish politicians, and they all turned out for Sister Margaret's date. <laughs> that is so amazing. Oh, my gosh. And you have perfect pitch, too. Can you hook him up with Dion? <laughs> yeah, Would you, yeah, you want to sing backup? Dion, <laughs> if he needs an old Irishman to sing backup. Uh, yeah. Oh my goodness! Well, Dad, thank oh you so much goodness. for talking to us today, okay. and I look forward I'm to. Trying to think if I have any other oh, yeah. questions, any questions? I'm sorry. before we let you go, though, Jack. Or and do they call you Jackie or Johnny or both? Oh, Jack, Jackie. You are always Jackie. Jackie, Jackie boy. I was Jackie boy. So you can call him Jackie boy if you want. Uh, maybe Tyler. I'm going to want to do that. <laughs> so let's see. What's your favorite adult Irish beverage? Adult beverage? Uh, Jameson. <laughs> oh, we'll be doing a lot of that this podcast. Dan is going to make his Irish soda bread for our show. Wow. And yeah, he's he's I a know, really great baker. We got lucky. We're in for a treat there. But he said he said I will only work for you guys if you supply me with Jameson and Guinness. <laughs> oh, Dan, <laughs> <So>. <laughs> wow. He has good taste. He does. He does. He sure does. Terrific. Yeah. Terrific. Yeah. All right, it's been a pleasure, Brian. I'll call you. All right, I love you, Dad. All right. Thanks, Jack, good for to talking talk to, to us. It was really nice to meet you. Nice to talk to you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Listening to good old Jackie Boy's story makes me think of that gorgeous piece of Gaelic music from the movie Brooklyn. The artist is Larla O'Leonard, and the song is Casada on Sugain. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Have a listen. <laughs> So I was raised Irish Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, after college, I went backpacking with a couple of friends of mine, and um, I really loved Ireland. I took a, a leave mm -hmm. to explore Ireland on my own, and it was the first time I was alone. I mean, it was the first mm. time... I mean, I, I can remember, you know, saying goodbye to my parents when mm -hmm. I went to school and how that emotionally is I'm like, wait, I'm leaving the nest. You know, it's like you're on your own, but you're not really on your own. Mm -hmm. It's all sort of built in with events to go to mm -hmm. or you know, mm -hmm. di dinners at this time. These are your classes. So like dorm mates dorm or mates housemates and, or something. Yeah. And um, but so here I am in Ireland for the first time, a strange country. Thank God they spoke English. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine having that experience um, not knowing the language. Hmm. Anyway. Sometimes that's a fun thing, though. Well, now as I get older, yeah, yeah of course. It's like, oh, I can do this. Like yeah. It's like baby steps. It's like, well, first, we'll start you in Ireland. <laughs> At least you know the language. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then we're going to plop you in Brazil. That's and so good funny. luck. No, when we left <laughs> like, Peace Corps, my husband, oh, we yeah. split off. So we went to uh -huh. Russia together, and then we split off there. And he traveled with one friend, and he wanted to go to like, English-speaking countries. He was like, I just want to go someplace where I'm going to blend in mm -hmm. in every way. So they went to Ireland. Ireland, Amsterdam, and England. Perfect. My friend, my other friend, um, Oren, he and I went to Egypt, oh my God. Israel, Jordan, Syria, Turkey. Did you know any of the languages? Uh, no. Uh -huh. Did I'm you have a little to... guidebook and no. you point to stuff? To how would, how did think you... think about this, because what would have been spoken there? There's probably some Arabic going on. Uh, huh, that's very interesting. Did you just use English? And probably hand mm -hmm. gestures. Wow, so you went there, and yeah. then you were on your own. And yeah, and so, yeah, I remember getting on a bus and leaving Dublin, and um, I'm like, where's the furthest north I can go? So I get to Donegal, and then the sun is setting, and, and I'm looking at my guidebook. I'm finding the, the hostel that I'm going to stay at that night, and all the signs are in Gaelic. So I, I wasn't anticipating what? this at all. Yeah, so, like, 
I couldn't read Gaelic, so I couldn't. I had the English of what the hostel was called, mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh my god! And then it's starting to rain, and then I have this crazy huge backpack that I decided to bring, and I'm like, what am I gonna do? Where am I gonna sleep on the road? Like my father was saying, the roads are a little desolate, especially up in the outskirts of big cities. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, but still, you know, street lamps, and so I'm just sitting on this rock. Sitting on a rock, and it, and on some old country road yeah, at night, and yeah, cattle are crossing the street. I, I don't remember the cattle, but <laughs> donkeys. <laughs> the, smell, the smell of cattle for sure. And I was raised Catholic, so I probably may have spoken to God um, at that time and mm -hmm. said, "Please help me." And I look over in this sort of mangy three-legged dog with like one eye hobbles up to me and sort of nudges at me, trying to get my attention. I'm like, oh, hello, yeah, okay, I have no food for you. And um, he walks a little bit away from me and then stops and turns back. And I look at him and and then um, I turn away and then he barks and then I turn mm. back and then he hobbles a little forward and edging me to get up and follow him, which hmm. took me a while to get. But once I did, he, he led well, clearly me. Clearly his signs with the one eye and the three <laughs> legs are not very clear. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, well, I have nowhere else to go. I don't yeah. know where else to do. I'm not going to sit on this rock all night. Yeah, it's pouring rain. Pouring yeah. rain. So I follow this dog. Not too far. The equivalent okay. of a couple of blocks, I follow this dog. And sure enough, he leads me directly to the hostel that I'm looking for. Get out of no. here. I, I, oh, I get shivers I know, again. I am too. Look, that is nuts. <laughs> I got goosebumps. And of course, just like all apparitions, uh -huh. you turn away and you look back and they're gone. The dog was gone. <gasps> the dog didn't stay at the hostel. I never saw the dog again in my life. It's very freaky in a magical way. <laughs> I always want to believe these things. You know, I like your, I want to have something like that to believe in. That's fantastic. I think I had a Guinness when I got in and mm -hmm. I'm warming up and I'm like, oh, that lovely dog, God. And I'm like, oh, it was God. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So wow. I don't know. I, I think the signs are out there mm -hmm. if you're open. That's so wild. Well, um, I mean, I definitely think mm -hmm. there's, there's more out there than we know yeah. of, right? I mean, it would be awfully pompous of us to think we knew absolutely everything about everything. Right, right. And... Clearly, there's some unexplainable stuff. Right. Hmm. That's a um, wonderful story. Though. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's a memory of Ireland and and the lovely dog god and um, the luck of the Irish. Yeah, the people were extremely wonderful. I think it helps that I was Irish. I, I think it oh, helps sure. that I introduced myself as Brian Joseph Patrick Delaney. Is that what you said? Oh my, my gosh. Brian Joseph yeah. Patrick Oh, totally. Delaney. I totally mm -hmm. played that card. It's always interesting when you're traveling and you have that experience where mm. you're like, oh, this is fantastic. And you talk to other people and they're like, you're nuts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it is. And well, yeah. and some of it maybe is, I, I don't know, maybe some of it's what you give off. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's definitely, okay, you play your you know, you play your magical Irish card, but at the same time, you're, as we've said before, you're a very friendly man. Oh, and I think that people definitely react to that and they respond to that sort of friendliness. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I know I have generally have a very nice time traveling as well. And people will be like, oh, I, you know, this was a hard city to travel in or don't go to this place. It's, you know, it's, it's not a good time. And I, you know, consistently have a nice time. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think it's because we're nice people. Do you have any Irish story? So you were in Ireland. No, I've never been to Ireland. Oh, you've never been? No, it's one oh. of the few places I haven't been. Oh, but your Irish brogue is so, oh, so spot on. <laughs> and am I going to get to see you in your leprechaun suit? <laughs> I've never been to Ireland. I took a dialect class in college. Lovely. Actually, my Irish one wasn't the best of all the ones I learned either. <laughs> either. It was for uh, acting classes. So yeah. if you were going to play an Irish lassie, you'd know how to talk like her. Pork sausage and ham thinly sliced, onions, taters, and barley enticed. It's called coddle, no troublin'. The cook's up in Dublin. They'll serve up this dish lightly spiced. Dublin coddle, a warming meal of sausages and potatoes, dates back to the 1700s. Its popularity has been attributed to the fact that back in the day, an Irish wife could go to bed and leave it simmering on the stove for hours so that it might be ready for when her husband arrived home from the pub. The meal remains a popular choice for busy people who prefer to prepare food in advance, and then head out and let the oven do the work.
Coddles are a really useful way of using up any stray rashers of bacon, sausages, and other root vegetables that you have in your home. The name coddle is most likely descended from coddle, which comes from the French term meaning to boil gently, parboil, or stew. Today, the word is associated with gently cooked eggs. Dublin coddle is best served with a pint of Guinness on the side and lots of Irish soda bread to mop up the gravy. Now it's time to get out of the studio and into the kitchen to make this tasty Dublin coddle. All right, I think we're ready to do this. Dublin Coddle is an Irish one-pot collaboration of bacon, pork sausage, potato, and onions. Today we made it magically delicious by adding carrots, garlic, thyme, bay leaves, and my favorite, a bottle of Guinness, or actually a can of Guinness, the draft in the can. It was very simple. You chop up all your vegetables. Nothing uniform. This is a very simple stew where you just really roughly chop up everything. You cook your bacon for about 15 minutes in a large Dutch oven on the stove top at a medium heat. And if you don't have a Dutch oven, some big pan in general would work with a lid on top. Our pot was gorgeous as you'll see in the pictures. I'm getting ready to throw the bacon into the cast iron. I used apple wood slab bacon and bits in the ends of bacon rather than the full strip and you can get that at any grocery store. You brown that, then you remove the bacon. And I'm just gonna chop up some of the really big bits. We cook this perfectly in that Dutch oven. I love cast iron for that. We then threw into the bacon grease about a pound and three quarters of pork sausage. You cook your seven to eight sausages for three minutes on each side. Look how pretty and roasted that side is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love how the ends are sort of split open too and you can see the meat trying to just ooze out of them. Remove those and then you cut the links into quarters. I did remove a little bit of the bacon grease with a paper towel. You know, judge it to your eye. I'm going to throw the onions in there, saute them slightly before we layer the dish. Oh yeah, I have one whole layer that's already caramelized. Right. We threw the third, the onions, parsley, carrots, the potatoes into the bacon grease, stirred that all together and to soften it, and the rest we kept raw. Add the Guinness, and you stir that in with two tablespoons of flour. With that bottom layer, we added some thyme and the garlic. And then we went ahead and started our layering process. So you take the bacon. And cooked sausage with the raw vegetables. Potatoes, carrots, onions. Parsley. A little salt and pepper on each layer as well. It's not going to need a ton of salt just because the bacon and the sausage are so salty. True. It looks like it could feed an army of Irishmen, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Like Plus, you know, you Irish love your potatoes. <laughs> Look beautiful. I love that we're leaving the skin on the potato too. too. Meat, vegetable, it looks like it's sort of pretty even. More carrots, more potatoes, more sausage, more bacon, etc. till you've finished out your layering process. And finally, we poured the chicken broth on top. Our pot was rather large. Cover it, put it in the oven at 300 degrees for two hours. And that's it. It's gonna be exciting. I just love the idea of being able to quick prep this up and throw it all in the oven and just forget about it. We're just waiting patiently until it comes out. This is so fun learning about these new things. You know, I've never had made a coddle. I'd never even heard of a coddle. I wasn't aware that corned beef and cabbage is not a traditional Irish St. Patrick's Day celebration meal. It's, it's more of an American Irish celebration food. And the Dublin coddle is the more traditional. And it smells so good. I can't wait to taste it. We'll see how our magically delicious stew comes out. <laughs> Two hours later. It really is tasty. This is going to be on my menu regularly. And there you go. You'll have to check out our photos on our blog. That's right. Too raw. Welcome our guest baker, Dan Fagan. Welcome to the kitchen, Dan. Thanks. So excited to be here. I can't wait to try the coddle stew. And thank you for inviting me to cook this Irish soda bread. It's one of the quickest, easiest, best breads you'll ever make, and it's not nearly made enough. One of the things we like to do on Peace, Love, and Soup is occasionally accompany our soup with something very fancy, but really simple that you can impress your friends with. 
Ireland wasn't known for its bread. It was a potato country. That was their starch. Irish soda bread came about in the mid-1800s because of the potato famine in Ireland. We made this when I was growing up. I learned how to make it from my mom. And it's hard to make wrong. It's very simple ingredients and we're using baking soda as the leavening agent. Baking soda has been around since the Egyptians in one form. In the late 1700s, there's talk about it being invented by a British chemist. This guy, White, developed it to essentially help his wife, who was allergic to yeast. The bakers sitting around waiting for yeast were clamoring. They didn't have granular yeast and had started producing bread using sodium and hydrochloric acid. Essentially, you're talking the classic chemistry fair volcano. In the 1830s, the bakers started using baking soda because it shortened their time. It was not really mass produced, not really commercially made until about 1843. And then it transitioned in that instead of using hydrochloric acid, which is kind of crazy, people in the house actually started using it with buttermilk. And it produced that same chemical reaction to create the carbon dioxide to leaven the bread. And it takes a fraction of the time. Let's preheat that oven to 450. Super straightforward, three cups of flour, one and three quarter teaspoon of kosher salt, and the all important baking soda, one and a half teaspoon. And then we're going to whisk that in the bowl. It'll also help evenly distribute that baking soda. A pretty heavy duty pan is somewhat vital to this. You could use a ceramic or a cast iron one, and ultimately, you need to have a lid. Traditionally, this was baked in an open hearth, and it was buried in coals. That's pretty fascinating. It is. Wow. So this is simpler than I even thought. Yeah. Go ahead and line it with parchment to make sure that there's no sticking. If you felt you needed to grease the pan, you could do it. But one of the nice things I think about this bread is the only fat is in buttermilk. So buttermilk, what? Is that before it turns into butter? No. Well, traditionally, buttermilk is actually the byproduct of making butter. <gasps> You churn the butter and you're left with a liquid, which was called butter milk. Oh my goodness. And this has a very reduced amount of lactose in it, for those of you who are lactose intolerant. I have done some cooking where it'll say if you don't have buttermilk, you would take a cup of milk and you would take a tablespoon out and replace that with a tablespoon of vinegar or a tablespoon of lemon juice. Yep. And that's your buttermilk substitute. And once you add the buttermilk liquid, it reacts with the baking soda and that reaction is not a long reaction like with yeast. You really do need to move through that process of adding the liquid then to bake fairly quickly because it will stop reacting and you can lose some of your eyes. Put the liquid in and almost immediately put it in the oven. Yeah, especially when you're doing a bread. So we've incorporated the dry ingredients and now we're going to add our liquid. And I forgot to shake the buttermilk. You just do that because sometimes what is left of the fat clumps. So we're going to add two and a quarter. Oops. So I'm going to start the mix. I'm just going to kind of fold it around just to see how this starts to come together. Why don't we do the rustic? Minimal stirring. Rough and lumpy, and it'll be too sticky to handle with your hands. We have the great consistency here. It looks a little like cauliflower. Oh, it does. I'm getting most of it off the bowl. I want a nice deep score. Are you making a cross? I am. In a lot of bakeries in Europe, you still go in and buy a half or a quarter loaf of bread. Mm. We're going to pop this in the oven for 45 minutes with the lid on. My kids always love Irish soda bread, and every year they're waiting for it to come out at the market. And I'm delighted to now know how to do it at home. You take the lid off, get a little peek. It should have crunchy little crags. Internally, the temperature is supposed to be 210 degrees, but because we do not have an internal thermometer, we are going to go on faith. We'll continue to cook it for an additional 15 minutes. I want to ask you while we're waiting, where are the raisins? Where's the exterior flour I'm so used to seeing? The Irish soda bread has taken many forms over the years. The English, Scottish, Irish, and the Syrians actually are the cultures that are thoroughly ensconced in a tradition with the soda bread. And those additions of fruits or nuts really came much later. So we've taken the Irish soda bread out of the pan and moved it over to a cooling rack. The bottom and the outside will be crunchy. 
One of the best things about baking bread, as we all know, is the smell. You walk into a room, your home, a bakery, you get this smell. And this bread has a very specific smell. And I don't know if everybody else thinks it smells like what I think. So I want you to step up and give it a good whiff while it's still warm. It smells like pancakes to me. To me, it smells like a overcooked cookie. I smell a pretzel. Maybe whatever your brain finds most comfort and joy in, that's what you smell. What are you smelling out there? Make your own Irish soda bread at home. Take a good whiff and let us know what it smells like. We'll maybe have a little recap of that on our Facebook page. I can't wait to dig in. It's so moist. All those holes of air. That's the carbon dioxide created in that chemical reaction. It's like really light but chewy. It's wow. like sandwich bread. As far as I know, this is really the traditional. It's so delicious. And it's going to go really great with our coddle. Who can bake a loaf of bread this good in an hour? I think when our listeners realize how easy it is, they're going to just be making bread more often for themselves, or at least this type of bread. Good doesn't need to be hard. You're, You're listening, listening to, to Peace, Peace, Love, Love and, and Soup. What's up going on with it? We've got hail and snow. It's perfect weather for Irish stew. And so and some people drop by the house. Does it make you want to cuddle when you think Irish of it? Irish cuddle? Cozy and warm. So let's, uh, let's retire and have some discussion over Guinness and Jameson. We're going to see what they think of the Dublin cuddle. Where's that bread? The bread is the right consistency to just soak it up. Mm-hmm. There is so many flavors going on. I don't sure which one to focus on. Very aromatic. Very sweet and a mommy at the same time. I love it. Yeah. I really love the sausages in mm. here too. It's hearty and it's absolutely delicious. Oh, I just love all of it. Outstanding. Warm, belly filling coddle. Thank you all again for inviting me to join you. Cheers. Cheers. Lent generally is over St. Patrick's Day, right? Mm-hmm. And Irish aren't supposed to be drinking during Lent. On holidays, they can drink. That is an exception, which is why people associate a lot of drinking with St. Patrick's Day, especially here in this country. It's your one day of drinking during Lent. Look at that. That's fantastic. (laughs) Some Irish are um, offended by the association to a drunken Irishman. I actually revel in it. (laughs) I'm right there with you, brother. That's why we're friends. (laughs) Tave, you? I only had like a couple sips of yours. (laughs) We have another one of those? (laughs) Cheers! As always, if you'd like to make this magically delicious meal for your family, the recipes can be found both on our blog, kboo.fm forward slash peace, love, and soup, or you can like and follow us on Facebook. And of course, photos, photos, photos can be found on both sites. Magically delicious, delicious, delicious. What's What's the the difference between between soup and and stew? stew? Soups generally require little time to cook, while stews are cooked slowly over low heat and for a longer period of time. Stews have less liquid, and it is more like a gravy than a broth. It can be served on a plate, while soup must always be served in a bowl. Always. Always. In my opinion, the difference between a soup and a stew is that a soup has pasta or like some sort of grain in it. Compared to stew, it's got more like chunky vegetables, meat, potatoes, kind of thing. A stew to me is something that's heartier, that's like thicker, you want to have it with like in a bread bowl or something like that that is going to stay together and soup to me is like a lighter, kind of like minestrone. Like The difference to me personally, stew is going to be something hearty, homemade, something that is heartwarming, is soul warming as opposed to a soup, which is more of just like a blended, whatever we have left in the kitchen, it gets tossed into a pot and it becomes a soup, so. Think thick and think thin. Thin soup, thick stew. I feel like a stew is a meal, and soup is something that is like a precursor to a meal. I think a a stew has got chunks in it. Big potatoes, meat and that sort of thing, but a soup is like a consomme without big stuff, and if if it's anything, it's all mixed up, you know, like like in a blender, and it's very soupy. Yeah. How about uh, Irish jokes? Do any of you know an Irish joke? An Irish stew is usually made with no, lamb. No, George, George, a joke. Oh, I, I thought you wanted an Irish stew. People ask us if anything's worn under the kilt. We reply, uh, nothing's worn under the kilt. Everything's in perfect working order. <laughs> That's my dad, by the way. So, um, it's my first St. Patrick's Day actually being Irish. Um, I recently traced my family back to Northern Ireland. And uh, we're related to the Baileys up there, so had to, had to drink some Baileys today. So I'm really stoked to celebrate my heritage and can't wait to get out to Ireland next year to check it all out for real. So 
I'm going to be um, looking up some of the churches in Northern Ireland to really try to trace back my roots and get hooked up with some ancestors out there. You had no uh, idea ahead of time that you were Irish. We had an inkling, but we never quite um, knew for sure. But my great aunt actually traced us back to Emily Bailey, one of five families that came over through South Carolina to Georgia. So they got a land grant from the government and they settled in Southern Alabama, which is where I'm born and raised. And um, we actually found a diary that she kept where she talks about having to fight to keep their land grant safe. And she was like fighting too. And I'm like, yeah, that's right, <laughs> fighting Irish. So I feel like I get my spunk from her, so. <laughs> yeah. That's a wonderful story. You always think of the Irish settling like Northeast. I didn't know they went as far south. I didn't either. I thought they always came in through like New York or somewhere, but they came in through South Carolina and they worked their way from Georgia down. So yeah, we're travel bloggers. We're the Wonderlust dietitian. I'm a dietitian by trade. So yeah. Cool. Well, thank you, you nice guys. Nice to meet you guys. Yeah, thanks, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs>